Do you know we're going to get to do that in eternity? Around the throne. <sighs> Singing holy, holy, holy is he. It just melts me. Ah. <sighs> And everybody there is going to have perfect, pure, clean hearts. No fake, nothing. Because of the living water. Because of the manna from heaven. Because all of our springs are in him. This grace... It should level us. It should, it should bring us down, in, not in fear, but in, I, you know, I don't speak Swahili, but I know what Asante meant. And that's it, isn't it? Oh, Lord, what do you have done for us? He is so good. So I want you to... Consider all that's been said here today. All that the Lord's already done in your heart. And um, there's more. He wants to do more. Every day, all the time, he wants to do more. So, you know, maybe you're a straggler. What that means is maybe you're a person who considers slowly and kind of sneaks in Um. I'm hoping and praying that this message connects with you, with your spirits, in a way that enables you to see the grace, the total grace of God. Uh, I don't usually title my messages, but this one is called Table of Grace. That song we sang earlier, Hear the Good News, You've Been Invited. That song speaks of the poor being on the same level as kings, that in his eyes we all are equal because of what he's done, because the plate's always full, and it's never too late. So I want you to consider the invitations regarding drinking of that living water and eating of the bread of life. Consider how many times you've heard that today He's going to keep saying, come to me. Come to me. Keep coming to me. It's not like, oh, well, you didn't come yet. It's keep coming. Come on. Come on. Come on. There is a feast coming up in heaven. The marriage supper of the Lamb, as spoken of by Jesus, and an invitation has been sent out to all, who will answer it? The, I, I can't wait to see what's he going to serve because the Lord has been preparing this since eternity passed. And it's going to blow our minds. There's another marriage feast that we hear about in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. That, that was where Jesus performed that first miracle in Cana. He turned water into wine. And I'm giving you the references so you'll go back and read it later. And when you do, I want you to pay attention to the heart of God in these passages for you, for them. I love that one because the lowly servants that were, uh, well, I, you know, I don't think they're lowly. To me, the servants that serve us, they're, they're the ones up here. But the ones in that passage, they got to see firsthand Mary sneaking off, telling her son, hey, they ran out of wine. And he tells this, and she says to them, just do whatever my son says. Do whatever he says. And he told them to just fill up those jugs with water. And they got to watch that happen. Nobody else saw it happen. They got to watch it happen. Jesus um, mentions another 
wedding feast in Matthew 22. And he's comparing the kingdom of heaven with a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his slaves to call those who'd been invited to the wedding feast, but they were unwilling to come. Imagine, they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, tell those who've been invited, behold, the food's ready. Food's getting cold. That's what we say at home. Food's getting cold. It's on the table. So he sent out a second, hey, reminder, come in. Everything is prepared. My oxen, my fattened cat, uh, livestock, they're all butchered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They paid no attention. Let that not be us. When we hear the invitation of our God inviting us to come to his feasts, first they were unwilling, then they paid no attention. And they went on their way, one to his farm, one to his business, and the rest seized the king's slaves, and they mistreated them and killed them. It's a picture of the prophets. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. So the kingdom of heaven can be compared to the king who gave the wedding feast for his son. Those invitations were sent out to a lot of people, and they were unwilling. It's ready. The food's cooked. The meat's prepared. Come. Imagine. The Jews were the first ones to be invited to enter the kingdom of heaven as Jesus preached throughout Israel. And some came, and many did not. And so that grace then was extended to us. So the slaves went out into the streets. Thank you. They were told, go out into the highways and byways. And as many as you find there, invite them to the wedding feast. That's us, guys. We've been invited. We've been invited. And don't worry, the Lord's going to reveal himself to the Jews. Many will come. Anyway, we've been invited. So the slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, all they found, both evil and good. And the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But there was... There was a condition for being in there. You needed to have wedding clothes. Other places in the word, we're, we've seen where brides were, or, or where people were given wedding clothes. Wedding clothes. So the king came in and he looked over the dinner guests and he saw that there was a man not dressed in wedding clothes. And it just, just one is mentioned. And he said to him, friend... How did you come in here without wedding clothes? And he was speechless. I think that's going to be one of the things I asked the Lord about in heaven. Okay, what's, what are the missing words? Uh, what, what else happened there? But he was speechless. So the king said to the servants, bind him hand and feet, cast him out into outer, outer darkness. In that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called but few are chosen. And in this particular uh, account, the wedding garments were the determining factor when that king made a judgment, what they were wearing, what was being worn. The man's own clothes was unacceptable, just like our own righteousness. Our own righteousness is not clean enough. It's as filthy rags. 
The Lord has given us bridal clothes, wedding clothes. He's given those to us that are his. Remember in the story of Ruth? She comes back into Israel with her mother-in-law, Naomi, after all of their husbands had died. She's gleaning in the fields. She's poor. And they realize, Naomi realizes that Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, was there. And so in an appropriate way, Ruth was encouraged to go to where Boaz was after a hard day of work and ask him to redeem her. And it says that he put his cloak over her, indicating that she was wearing now the garments that he provided. And then he went and made all the details for the wedding, and she was married and And Naomi was also redeemed through her daughter-in-law because of the child that was born to Ruth and Boaz. There's an infant likened to Israel in Ezekiel 16. It says that the baby was, was cast out after it was born, and it was on the side of the road naked. It wasn't washed. Its cord was not cut. Her cord was not cut. And he came by and saw her, and he washed her, and he wrapped her up, and then she started to grow, and as she grew, when, it was, when, when she was older, he put his wedding garments onto her and took her into his heart, and she became his bride. In Revelation, robes are mentioned also. So these wedding garments are given to us by the Lord And we are to change clothes. We got to change clothes. We don't barge into heaven proud of our new dress, our new pair of pants. We're coming in there as the bride of Christ, covered in his righteousness. No pride allowed. I can't imagine why else you would not change into those clothes unless it was based in pride. So there's this meal being prepared. Attention has been given to every single detail. Have you ever had a party? Have you ever had a party where you made something that you don't usually make? Maybe you worked especially hard on, a, on an hors d'oeuvre, an appetizer, or a punch, a, a, a drink that was a mixture of wonderful juices and and you have it all laid out and you've put out a tablecloth and and you've sat back and looked at it much the way the ladies did as they were putting up the decorate a little to the left a little no perfect attention given to every detail and then your guests come and you offer them refreshment and they go oh no thanks i'm fine I ate at home. What an insult that would be. What what a disappointment, wouldn't it be? You know, you've gone to all this work. Um, Well, why is that? Well, maybe there's a jillion reasons, but really, I think it's that uh, it's a pro, you know, they don't make that whatever, that pinwheel as good as I do. I would have used cream cheese with chives. They only did the boring ones with capsicum. You know, just whatever it is, there's pride involved. Why won't you receive refreshment? Why won't you accept the refreshment of the host? So this invitation for you and me is to come. Come and drink of the living water. Come and eat of that. I want to talk a little bit about pride and forgiveness. I don't think it's always this overt arrogance kind of pride that says, okay, I accept that Jesus died for my sin, but, but, you get it? But. 
I'm, I'm, too, I'm too dirty. I've sinned. I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. I used to be the director of a pregnancy resource center in the United States. And one of the things that I loved doing was leading the class. Um, it was really a class on forgiveness for women that had had abortions. And I can't tell you how many, it seems like every single woman that came in there, in fact, the class, the last class I led, they were all believers. They knew the cross, they knew the gospel. And this one lady said, uh, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. And we hear that a lot. Have you, has anybody ever heard somebody say that? Yes, no? Yeah. Since when did God command us to forgive ourselves? When the Holy Spirit opened these women's eyes to that truth, it's not up to us to forgive ourselves. We don't have the capacity to cleanse ourselves and forgive ourselves. Does that make us forgiven? No. Forgiveness was paid for at the cross with the blood of Jesus. So we are commanded to forgive each other, and he forgives us, but we, our job, our, our response should be that we accept it. But there's a deception that happens sometimes. We, we're fooled into believing that, well, you know, we, we know that we reap what we sow, forgetting that the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. And sometimes there's stuff up here we never tell anybody that we've done in the past that we're still carrying around the weight of it, even if we're saved. Even if we have accepted the blood sacrifice for our sin, we carry the weight of it because it's a sorrowful thing. Here's what happens when we think that way. Here's part of that deception. When we say that I can't forgive myself, when I say that, I'm actually making my judgment higher than his. I'm saying I know more than him or my call is the accurate one and his is not. And I have mistakenly assumed that I know more than God. And in essence, what I'm doing is rejecting God's forgiveness for that one little thing. No, when he died, he died for all of our sin. All of it. And I realized, working with these ladies, that it wasn't that they were being overtly prideful. It wasn't that they were being rebellious. It's that they were deceived, which simply means they believed a wrong thing. They believed it. And when that, that was always the breaking point. I think it was an eight or 12 week course. I can't remember. That was always the day that the light bulb came on when they realized that they had believed the wrong thing. Well, where'd that thought come from? The evil one. He knows that they're forgiven, but he still wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he wants to steal your joy and my joy. And even though he knows I'm forgiven, he wants me to think that I'm not for that one thing I did you know, for slapping my cousin when I was a little kid, for whatever it is. And those are either coming from him and his minions or our own minds. And those thoughts need to be taken captive to the obedience of Christ and cast out.
in essence, when we say, well, I just can't forgive myself, we're actually rejecting God's forgiveness for that thing that he paid for on the cross because you think you don't deserve it. Well, you don't. See, that's the beauty of the gospel. You don't deserve it. But he already knows that. You don't have to hide that from him. He knows that. Peter, um, Peter, what a great... Uh, Josh said Thursday night that he, he could relate with Peter. I can too, because sometimes I just say the dumbest things. But the thing that I love about Peter is he's this big burly fisherman, you know, who, who becomes a disciple of Christ. And he uses the word precious all the way through his epistles. Peter understood the preciousness of the blood of Christ. And when I reject his forgiveness or poo-poo it away or say, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm rejecting his forgiveness. You see, it takes humility, too, though. That's where receiving that invitation starts. It starts with humility because we know we don't deserve that invitation, but they said I could come anyway. And so we go. And so there's something that needs to happen here. When the deception is discovered or when we realize that our righteousness isn't the same as his, it's time to cast off that deception. It's time to reject the deception that our own unworthiness or our own performance or our own failures or our own righteousness or our past sins disqualify us from entering in. If we've humbled ourselves and we, we agree with the Lord, yes, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord. His blood cleanses us. And his blood qualifies us. His blood alone. Nothing else. So we need to reject that lie. If you're still not quite believing it, your friends will tell you, no, that's a lie. You need to believe them too. Allow the Lord to change your heart in that. Reject the lie that his blood, what we're saying is his blood isn't sufficient. When we reject that forgiveness, we're saying it's not sufficient to cleanse and to forgive. What an insult to the God who gave his son's life, to Jesus Christ who poured out his blood. What an insult. Do I mistakenly disdain what Jesus did to pay for my entrance to that marriage feast? Am I saying his death isn't enough? You know what you do? You just say thank you. When the Lord shows you that, thank you, Father, that you have saved me. Um, for many years after I came to Christ, I was kind of tormented by nightmares of my past sin. I'd wake up, you know, and, and you know, just trying to get out from under it, just get out from under it. and Or in the daytime, I'd remember something that I had been in bondage to or whatever. And what the Lord taught me to do, how he taught me to take my thoughts captive, was to start a sentence of prayer with the word, thank you. Lord, thank you that you saved me from that horror. And then turn it around. Hallelujah that you've set me free. Thank you, Lord, that you have made that you have declared me clean, that you have declared me a child of God, your own bride. That's how you turn it around when those thoughts come in. Um, you know, a lot of times we just run around trying to whoop, 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 you know, just get away from them, get away from the thoughts. If we immediately go to thanks and gratitude to the Lord, the enemy is going to stop that tactic because it's not working. It backfires, and God gets the glory, and we get edified because we're remembering what he did to save us. I have a point in going here. 
<sighs> so say thank you and put on the garments and enter into refreshment. God is opposed to the proud, but he draws near to the weak and broken. And it's okay to say to him, I hunger and I thirst. I'm weak. I'm scared. I got dirty, Lord. I blew it again. And what does he do? He still keeps the invitation going to the table of grace. And I want to talk a little bit about what that table of grace looks like, what it looked like for some people in the word, and imagine what it's going to look like when we're there in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the meantime, we're partaking of his grace every single day. Do you remember the, the woman with the issue of blood? She had been afflicted for 12 years. The word tells us that she um, had spent all that she had going to every kind of doctor. If you ever get your hands on a commentary, research what the kind of medical care was in that day. It, it, it's horrific. So it talks about that in the passage, that she endured medical treatment. It was crazy, crazy stuff. Not only was she still afflicted with the issue of blood, not only had she endured the medical treatment, but it made her an outcast because she was unclean. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't go to the synagogue. She heard about Jesus. And the Scripture shows us that she just wanted to just, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. He, it was crowded. Jesus was on a 911 call already to go to the house of Jairus because his little 12-year-old daughter had died or was sick and was in that at, at point. It's crowded. There's people around. It wasn't proper for her to touch Jesus because she was unclean, and she, but she knew, she just knew. She'd heard about this, this Jesus. And if I could just, just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And so somehow she sneaks through that crowd and she touches his clothes. And Jesus stops what he's doing. He stops in his tracks. I'm sure Jairus is like, come on, my daughter. Jesus stops in his tracks, turns around. Who touched me? His apostles are like, what are you talking about? It's like being in the subway or something. You know, they're crowded or the market or um, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? And he, he could feel that virtue had gone out of him. He knew Somebody not only touched him, but they had received healing. And you know what he did? Our Jesus, he wasn't content to leave it there. You see, she'd been ostracized for 12 years. She came forward, and it was me. And he said, oh, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. If you search out those words, what you see is that he is addressing her spiritual condition as well as her physical condition. Go in, you know, you're, you're healed, but go in peace. The peace of God. That's what her table of grace looked like. Not just, okay, it, you know, my body's well again, but oh, he accepted me. He noticed me. And he commended me that my little belief, my little act, my crawling on the ground to try to get to the bottom of his robe meant something to him. He noticed her. And she went away different, never the same. That's what her table of grace looked like. How about the woman caught in adultery? She's brought forth 
in a very public place, embarrassing, surrounded by people with stones that just want to kill her, but they also want to trap Jesus, you know. Let's do a, a double thing. Let's, let's uh, condemn Jesus and the woman. Never mind the man. You know the story. Jesus writes on the ground. We don't know what he wrote. We'll find out in heaven. I'm going to ask him. Some people say that he started writing the names of the men in the crowd and perhaps their sin. It's conjecture. But we're told that they started leaving one at a time from oldest to youngest. And Jesus says to the lady, who must have been terrified, terrified, where are your accusers? And then he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's her table of grace. He rescues her. He sends her on with an exhortation. And he doesn't condemn her. That's her table of grace. Go and sin no more. That's part of that new life in Christ. We're called to that. We're called to wear the garments of his righteousness and go and sin no more. The Samaritan woman at the well, her table of grace was that he went out of his way to go to that town because he had an appointment to talk with someone that was trapped in sin, that was an, another outcast. He goes out of his way, and, and, and he, she's the one that he said, you know, if you knew, he asks her for a drink, and, and then he said, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink. Their conversation goes on, and she realizes this is not a normal man. And she goes and she tells the men in the city. That, that's very telling right there. Why didn't she tell the women? Probably, you know, she'd been married many times, and the man that she was with currently was not her husband. And Jesus acknowledged that. You're not married. But she went and told them, come and meet a man who told me all that I've done. Could this be the Messiah? And they received his grace. That's how Jesus behaves when he's confronted with our sin. He doesn't beat us with a stick, kick us down the stairs, throw rocks, encourage other people to throw rocks. Martha, Mary and Martha, a little bit different story. Martha was like the super host of the planet. Good at preparing food, running a household. Jesus could drop in with his 12 friends. And they'd be in there, you know, working up a feast. And she was really good at it. But she was angry that her sister decided to just go and sit at Jesus' feet and listen to him teach. Why don't you tell her to come and help, Martha said. Don't you see all the work that there is to do? You know, he doesn't condemn Martha. Oh, Martha, Martha, he says. You're, you're concerned with so many things. Mary's chosen what's better. And do you know what I notice about that story? Martha doesn't stop serving. You see her in other situations. And I think what happened that day was that Martha's heart was changed. I think she served with joy. There was nothing wrong with being busy to serve and wanting everything to be, to be best. But she was, you know, in a frenzy of her effort. And I think she forgot what it was all about. But Jesus transformed her. I love that about him. That's what, that's what uh, her table of grace looked like. So many accounts in the scripture. And you have your own accounts. I have my accounts. So... What's that look like? That's what it looks like. Jesus meeting us at our worst, cleaning us up, putting on these beautiful garments. So where is the table of grace? It's everywhere. Remember Hagar? Hagar was Sarah's servant. Sarah couldn't get pregnant. So after some time of receiving the promise of God, she gets tired of waiting. 
She knows that there was a promise that they'd have a child, but they can't make it happen. So Sarah takes things into her own hands, and Hagar had no choice. She's a servant. Hagar is sent in to Abraham to become impregnated by him so that they could have a son. After she had a son, you can see Hagar's heart change. It says, you know, she became arrogant toward Sarah. So Sarah started mistreating her. Later, years later, when Sarah got pregnant, Hagar's son was teasing Sarah's son. And Sarah had had enough and told Abraham, get rid of them. So Hagar is kicked out. Out into the wilderness, out into the desert. Their provisions are gone, and she's thirsty. And she sits down, puts her son under a bush, tree, whatever it was. And she is hopeless, and she's sobbing under the tree. And the Lord sends an angel to her and shows her, I think I have that wrong, why are you crying? And showed her a spring. Her eyes, she was so hopeless, she couldn't even see that there was a provision for her. Not only did she get water, which preserved their life, but she was given a promise. Don't worry, your son is going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of descendants. So she's kicked out of her only home she's been in, and now she gets to go and be with where they went. Her son obviously grew up, got married, had kids, grandkids, and on and on and on and on. But the Lord came to Sarah, to, excuse me, to Hagar in her hopeless state. That's what her table of grace looked like. And that's where it was. It was out in the wilderness. I, I don't like wilderness experiences, but if I love reading about them because all of them in the word are amazing. Amazing things happen in the wilderness. Up to the Israelites, when they needed water, and they struck the rock, Moses struck the rock the first time spoke, and was supposed to speak to the rock the second time. It doesn't say a little creek came out, a little rivulet of water. It says rivers of water. How else are you going to give water to that many people? So that's a wilderness story. So many wilderness stories in the word. I should say account. Somebody rebuked me one time for saying stories because it implied that they were like fairy tales or something. Psalm 23 says that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. So sometimes that table of grace happens when you are surrounded by your enemy. He prepares the table. The servant... Abraham's servant was sent back to find a bride for Abraham's son, Isaac. And they were, he was to avoid a certain idolatrous area and go back to this place and find a wife. And he's like, well, what if they don't believe me? Well, what if, I, what, what if she won't come with me? So, so he puts out this uh, prayer. Okay, here's how I'll know if it's her. You know the story. I'm going to come to this town, and I'm going to sit by this well. And the women came down, and he asks for, he said, if, if the woman, if I'm going to ask for a drink, and if she offers to feed the ten camels as well, I'll know that's her. That's exactly what happened. I, I just researched the other day how much water camels drink, and it was crazy amount of water and if she's I'm assuming it's a well that she can walk down into but even if it was the kind that you pull up with a rope she worked and worked and worked to to give water to those camels 
And so that table of grace happened in a foreign place for that, and he got to see the provision of God. When we walk by the wayside, when we lie down, um, the, the 5,000 people, is this the third time I think they've been mentioned today? The 5,000 people that were far away from the towns, uh, their table of grace was out in the pasture somewhere or something. And then there's going to be that one at the, that last, at the Last Supper. There, there was the one at the Last Supper that Jesus had with his people where he said, here's my body broken for you. Here's my blood, my covenant with you. So that invitation has been issued. Refreshment is found in Christ Jesus. We're offered grace. We're offered garments, and we have a choice. Dina talked about this. You, you can say yes or no. It's up, you know, God doesn't have robots for disciples. You can say yes or no. But if you want his living water, you have to grab the cup and drink. And that spring is right there in front of you. And so we bow down and we fill our cup and we put it to our lips. There's a song that came out. I think it was Robin Marks. Have you ever heard it? Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. It's a great song. But it talks about trading in your sorrow for joy. That's our participation in it. Trading in feeling dead inside. That's a feeling. I know you might feel dead inside. I've been there myself. I asked the Lord, Lord, I feel dead inside. And he reminded me of uh, Ephesians where it says that he's made alive. He's made us alive together with him. So my feeling was the lie. The truth was that he says I'm alive. I just didn't feel alive. So I asked him to help me feel alive. And he does. I, you, you trade it in. You trade your thirst, you trade your hunger, your sin, your weariness, your exhaustion, your despair, and your depression. You get rid of your broken cisterns and whatever you've been drinking. You trade your shame. Stop holding it in a bag like it's a little special treasure. Cast it off. Cast off the pride because you know that's the lie and put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness and rejoice. Rejoice. Praise the Lord. And then those who sing, as well as those who play the flute, shall say, all my springs of joy are in you. I don't know, maybe, maybe none of you have wrestled with that kind of belief, but I think you have. I think it's common to man, and I want to tell you, it's time to change clothes. It's time to take off garments that are mourning clothes, black, sorrowful, I'm in mourning, and put on the garments of his righteousness, the garments of praise. You do the right thing, and the Lord will deal with your feelings, and you are essentially, you're telling your brain what to do. Stop letting your brain tell you what to do. You tell your brain what to do. That's what taking thoughts captive is to the obedience of Christ. You need to know what the Word says so that you'll know what truth is. But that's it. That's my wrap it up. You know, you've heard all day about the living water, the bread, the dancing, the singing, the joy. You've seen, you've partaken in the dancing and the joy. But if there's any stragglers out there, anybody that's still feeling that, mm, come and talk to one of the women after. Pray, let them pray with you. Um, it's time to change clothes. Put on the garments of praise. Put on your wedding garments and cast off those things that are dragging you down. Father, you're amazing. 
You are wonderful, and you have made every provision for us. We say yes. We say yes, Lord. We've been grieving and mourning, and it's time to allow you to strengthen us, to fill us with your joy. It's time for us to remember the joy of our salvation and just revel in the glory and the grace that you've given to us. It's time for us to remember what you have prepared for us in the future. And now it's time for us to realize every day the grace that you have for us. So, Father, from this moment on, we want to, any time these thoughts come, we want to, instead of trying to run away from the thought, Train ourselves to say, thank you that you paid for that. Thank you that you will avenge that. Thank you that you are a righteous judge. Thank you that you are going to make this right even when we can't see a way. Thank you that I know you are going to heal me of this. And Lord, I focus my attention, my attitude, my heart, my words, and my songs on you On you, Lord, I choose to put on a garment of praise and get rid of that spirit of heaviness. May that be the case, Lord, for every person in this room. Will you bless them, Lord? Will you rescue them? Will you show them, Lord, areas that they have believed a lie? And may they let go of any lies where they think they're not forgiven of something. How it grieves your heart when your children are ripped off that way. In Jesus' name. I want to say one more thing. Um, back when my, I've, I have a lot of children, I, and there, there are two groups of them. We had two, and then we were going to, because we were only going to have two, and then we stopped having kids. And then five years later, the Lord changed our hearts, and we had five more children in four and a half years. We had twins at the end. And and then later, we kind of adopted a girl whose mama died and she needed a family. We needed her too. But um, when my kids were small, my older two would watch the younger five on occasion if I had to run to the store or whatever. And, or maybe somebody else at church did or something, but the little ones would come and tell us afterward that so-and-so said this to me about a particular punishment that daddy was going to do for whatever. And we would become incensed because how dare you tell my child that their father is very angry at them. If he's angry at them, he'll tell them and he'll sit down and talk with them. And I think the Lord, I think it grieves his heart when the enemy speaks lies to us or when we receive our own lies because it steals from us the confidence of the Father's love. He loves you. You are precious in his sight. You were bought with a price. He has given you garments and they're garments of praise. And so take off the old and put on the new and walk in the confidence that you are deeply loved by your creator, your husband. Okay? Yes. All right.